good evening, everybody. Welcome to I Saw a Bird, I Audubon Spring Migration Show. We're great, glad to have you on tonight. I saw a bird this weekend that I was very excited about. It was a female golden-winged warbler in Central Park, and we're going to pull up my picture of her here for you. Golden-winged warbler was my 38th species of wood warbler in Manhattan, um, and after that, it gets really hard. I'm going to have to hope for a rarity from out west. Uh, golden wing warblers are declining and Audubon is working with many partner organizations uh, and our scientists and conservationists across this country and others to help conserve the golden wing warbler. We're going to drop a link in the chat for you to learn more about that work. Hey Christine, what have you seen this week? Hey David, uh, that's such a cool bird and I'd love to see more warblers. This week I've been seeing a lot of cliff swallows here in the central flyway and I, there's a lake that I go to often, and I always see, we're pulling it up in the field guide right now, I always see them flying across the water. So they're really cool. And I've been hearing them too. So we can play their call from our field guide here. Such a distinctive sound. Yeah, very cheerful. Well, we have a great show lined up for everybody today. We're excited to welcome special guest, advertising executive and Audubon board member, Jeff Goodby. Then we will have a conversation about hemispheric conservation work with Audubon's International Alliances team and a member of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. We'll talk about the joy of finding and learning about female birds during migration. And then we'll close out with the demo of the Audubon app. So we're looking forward to all of that this evening. First up, I'd like to welcome Jeff Goodby to the show. Jeff is a renowned Audubon, um, sorry, advertising executive and a member of Audubon's board. He's chairman and founding partner of Goodby Silverstein and Partners, where he created the iconic Got Milk ads, numerous other award-winning advertising campaigns, and usually every year, several of the ads that you see during a certain big football game that people like to watch in January and February. Uh, he has, um, he's also an illustrator and he's a director. His illustrations have been published in Time, Mother Jones and Harvard Magazine. Um, I'm having a little bit of camera difficulty, but hopefully you can still hear me. Jeff, welcome to I Saw a Bird. Thanks so much for being on. Hey, David, Hi, Christine. Congratulations on the show. It's terrific. Thank really you. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Thank you so much. So I can't Jeff, see we have you, to... but you're there. Uh, yes, hopefully my camera will be back soon. Uh, everybody's <laughs> having internet trouble these days, right? So Jeff, we want to start though. by asking you, what, what birds are you seeing from home, Jeff? Well, I was up in St. Helena this week and uh, looking at my bird feeder and seeing the warblers and the titmouse that are usually there. And suddenly these two big Eurasian ringed doves landed there. And um, it was like a video game. They're so much bigger than the other birds. I was like, what the heck is that? So uh, my friend Eileen has uh, required me to have the, uh, the Audubon app with me at all times. And I looked in there and uh, discovered what they were. As you know, I'm not necessarily a, a birder. Um, so I really need, yeah, there you go. Look at that. They're beautiful birds. They're kind of, kind of stunningly uh, lush in person. Yeah, they look really cool. Mm. I love doves. Oh yeah, they're immediately a beautiful, gentle sign in your life to have. It's so great. Mm -hmm. And as you can see in the field guide, they're spread out throughout the country. So anyone, Did, anyone can see them. So here's a question yeah. for you, Jeff. Um, mm -hmm. You're not only a renowned advertising executive, but as David mentioned, you're also a member of Audubon's board. So I would love to know what brought you to birds? Well, it's a, it's a long story. I worked for a famous uh, and he said, listen, uh, do me a favor. Um, every year I do this uh, Audubon of California and uh, I, want, I want there to be a continuation of that. Will you meet with these guys and continue to do that? And I said, sure. So. Uh, he died and I met with the people from Audubon and I was like, geez, you know, brochures, come on. That's so yesterday's news. 
let's do something cool. And uh, in the middle of the meeting, they said, oh, we've got to leave. Um, there's a field of birds in Southern California, some tricolored blackbirds, and this entire strain could disappear if the farmer harvests this wheat. And I said, what are you going to do about it? And they said, we're going to go raise some money and buy the wheat before he harvests it. And I said, this is a movie. Let's make a film about this. So we did. We made a little three, four minute film um, called The Field of Birds. And uh, it's still used to raise funds down there. It's really low quality. I sent a couple of guys from my place down and they interviewed everybody and uh, shot it as best we could. I believe yeah. you have a, a little clip to show us as well, right? Good. I hope so. All right, here it is. Is it acceptable for a small species like the tricolored blackbird to simply vanish? What about two such species, or three? When do we decide the world just won't be the same without them? These are the questions looming here in a farmer's field, out in a valley in Southern California, but as it turns out, not that far away from any of us. That's really cool. I don't know what you're talking about, about the quality being low. I, I really like that. <laughs> oh, thank you. We're accepting a lot of low quality on the internet right now, <laughs> all of us. Okay, ringer's back. <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, that was a wonderful project to do. And it, it, it involved me with the Audubon people in California. And then somehow I think, uh, I think David um, Darnold, the, um, the director of Audubon USA, called me up and asked if I would be interested in being on the big board there, and I am. Mm -hmm. It's been great. Yeah, and we're so happy to have you. I think this is a good transition into the next question, which is the fact that you have a really unique view into what people like. So why do you think that birds appeal to so many people? Well, like I said, I think birds are kind of an early warning system about the natural world to us. And when we're in a place where there are no birds, it's spooky to us, something's wrong. And, um, and, and when you pay attention to birds and start to think of them that way, I think you realize how miraculous they are, that they're these little living things, little living ecosystems in and of themselves that, that do these remarkable things, travel great distances, um, do things that are totally unexplained and, and you know, things that we don't understand. And, um, and if you look at them, every one of them as a little miracle, um, I know that sounds a little over the top, but if you think about them that way, it really enhances your life. And at a time like this, you know, where we're stuck inside, it's just, they're, they're right there outside our windows. You know, they, they come to us. It's a miracle that comes to us, which is an amazing thing. They also, I think, bring families together. You know, we talk a lot at Audubon about teaching our kids to love birds. And, uh, and I think that, that in, this, in this kind of environment, people, friends, um, are coming together over birds. And I mean, this, the success of your show, I think, is, a, is proof of that. People are coming together over birds. It's a wonderful thing. So Jeff, a few years back, you helped Audubon launch a groundbreaking virtual bird watching competition called Birding the Net. And we let birds loose all over the internet. So let's check out a video and then talk about that a little bit. The National Audubon Society asked us to make birding cool. We set out to prove this was not your grandmother's Audubon by releasing thousands of beautifully rendered 3D birds on the internet. And just like in real birding, if you were patient enough, you could spot them. But there were 34 species to find and an entire internet to scour. To help their search, birders could follow our clue-giving guide birds. Players could also install a birdhouse scriptlet on their personal blog to attract birds. The first one to spot all birds won a trip to the Galapagos. What really surprised us was how players all helped each other out along the way. They created dedicated chat rooms and tutorial blogs, and we realized birding the net wasn't just cool, it was magical. It turned the cold digital world into a resonant reminder of what we love about the natural world around us, and introduced the next step, birding in the real world. But the most impactful result of all was sadness that it was over. And even now, over a month after the game has ended, love for birding the net lives on. What a fun reminder. That was all the way back in 2011, I believe. Jeff, what was your favorite thing about birding the net? Well, you know what? It, it did take a, a cold, uh, lonely place, the internet, and make it into and reminded us of the natural world around us as we're on there. 
And um, some people at my company figured out that they could do an overlay of existing websites and kind of have these birds land in there suddenly for a short period of time. And if you clicked on them, you'd learn all about them and get to collect them on your card. And um, it, and it was it was really quite a phenomenon when, when it was going on. I, I think we should do it again, actually. It was quite fun. Can you hear yeah, me? technology I'm... has certainly advanced a lot since 2011. It's amazing what we could do now. Yeah, so many people are asking to do it again. So I think a lot of people agree with you, Jeff. Yeah, I'd love to do it again. It was, it was really fun. And, you know, we have all of the tools to do it easily. You are an extra special guest today because you also helped create this show, I Saw a Bird. So it was your original idea to launch a variety show around the topic of spring migration and in response to all these stay-at-home orders happening around the country. So why do you think this is a format that would work, especially right now? Well, I don't want to take all the credit for the show. I think I saw a bird with David Sprays and, you know, and I might have suggested a show, but I didn't think you'd really do it. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's just the perfect thing for this time. And who knew that it was, I mean, we started out to have it basically be a celebration of the spring migration, which is the biggest you know, birding event of the year, really. Um, and it's just a wonderful thing going on around us. But now that became so much more resonant and important in the current situation where, you know, we're stuck inside, we're afraid of a natural phenomenon, we're afraid of a virus. Um, and these birds came to our rescue. It was, it's wonderful. The guests are great. It's very lively. It's, it's terrific. Yeah, yeah, we want to thank all of our viewers for making I Saw a Bird into what it's become, for sure. Um, so, Jeff, you know, you, your career, which has been really remarkable, um, and the sorts of iconic moments you've created in American culture, that's been about creating an emotional connection that moves people to take action uh, from their values and their interests. And so I'm wondering from that perspective that you've brought to your life and work, um, how do you think viewers should think about birds in this era? Well, I hope that knowing more about birds and even just having a regular kind of celebration of them every week, like we're doing here, um, motivates people to want to get more involved in, in the issues around birds. Birds are birds, and they, and they teach us again and again that politics is not something to enter into the, the natural world. And the more you learn about it, the less it needs to be that way. A few years ago, I actually wanted to make a film for Audubon called Why Birds Matter. And I, and I didn't want it to be like a blue state or red state thing. So I, I, I and I'm going to do this. I wanted to have hunters and cooks and, you know, people, people that weren't, weren't the regular bunch of people with binoculars talk about birds, poets, people like that. And I think that kind, when you look at it as something that serves all kinds of people in all kinds of situations from all walks of life. Um, it makes you want to get involved and try to do something to help out. You know, um, there, are, there are little things like the, or big things like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that I think would be, I think of interest to everybody to study, learn about, and, um, and make sure that it's sustained, that protect birds as they migrate and come to us. Yes, really well put. And we heard from a previous guest on I Saw a Bird, Catherine Hayhoe, about the importance of people talking to each other about the things that they value. And I think that goes hand in hand with what you're saying, Jeff. Yes, for sure. I think communication about this is what will make us aware of the things around us and make us want to protect them and, and um, you know, defend them against any kind of threats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that one of the things I love that you often talk about are the human connections that birds can facilitate and deepen. Something I've talked about with a number of reporters during this time. Um, so I'm wondering what your reflections are on not only how we enjoy birds, but how birds bring us together as people. Well, I think that, that obviously there, there are some, that you, it happens on so many levels. Um, I think there's a there's a there's first of all just a sense of beauty and connection to the natural world, you know. And John James Audubon, who I'm a big fan of, I think that uh, I, I think that just the immediacy of the beauty of birds is um, is stunning and, and apparent to everybody, you know. I mean, you'd you'd have to be cold and dead not to appreciate that. But I think I think a deeper thing is to is to share that to share that beauty 
in that connection with other people. And um, and obviously in, in this day and age with the with the internet, with all the information that you can get about birds, with with the way you can talk to other people. I mean, look at the um, look at the chat conversation that's going on right now on this show. I mean, it's wonderful to share this stuff and talk about it and compare notes. And when I look at the chat stream on the show, I learn a lot just from that, you know? I mean, the people that watch the show are, are pretty smart and uh, I learned a lot yeah. from it. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, such a terrific audience. Um, yeah. And Jeff, before we let you go, we have a question from our audience. Lara wants to know what lessons from advertising can be lent to advocating for birds? Oh, I mean, all kinds of things. And I, I think, you know, the first lesson of advertising is to make it welcome in people's lives, to, talk, to do something that people are interested in and care about. And obviously, that's the way to approach words, you know, to make them relevant to people, um, to talk to them about, you know, what, what, what is a bird in their lives. And that's why, you know, hunters and, and people that, are, that have different aspects on the bird, different perspectives on birds, I think are very important to talk to and to talk in their language. And I think that's the lesson of advertising here. I love that. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight, for lending your creativity to all, all that Audubon does um, and everything you do for birds. Thanks so much. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Thank you. you. All right. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. All right. Well, and again, to all of our viewers, we're sorry about all the internet connectivity issues tonight. I think the network is under real strain with so many people at home, as I know we're all experiencing. Um, so moving on to our next segment, we know that uh, many of the brilliantly colorful migratory birds that we're all enjoying uh, this spring are on their way from Central and South America up to far northern landscapes to nest and raise their young, landscapes like the Arctic and the boreal forests of Canada. That's why Audubon's International Alliances program is such an important part of our conservation work because we work in partnership all across the hemisphere to protect these birds all along the way for their long, long journeys. Um, so we wanna to welcome to the show this evening, Diego Ochoa, who's an Audubon representative in the South American nation of Colombia, Jeff Wells, who is Audubon's vice president for boreal conservation, and Shauna Morgan Seegers, who's the operations manager for the Indigenous Leadership Initiative critical partner for Audubon's international efforts in Canada. Welcome to the show, all three of you. Hi. <laughs> Hola. Hola. Um, so since so many of, uh, so, so much rather of Audubon's international work involves Colombia and the boreal forest, let's start with a fun question, maybe get a little competition going. How many birds can we find in Colombia and in the boreal forest respectively? Diego, why don't you tell us about Colombia? Well, uh, I don't want to brag, but we are the birdiest country in the world. If you come down, you will be able to watch among 1,909 species that we registered in wow. our country. No other country has more birds than Colombia. Well, that sounds like it's worth a little bit of bragging. I think we can let you, let you slide there. Jeff, how about the boreal forest? Boreal forest um, is um, a lot bigger and has uh, a huge intact forest area, but it doesn't have the diversity of birds, but it has instead a great abundance of birds, actually one to three billion with a B that nest across the boreal forest. Only about 400 species, but about one to three billion that nest, uh, nest there. All right, well, I think we have some photos to show examples from each place. So uh, let's look at these examples from Colombia, just stunning birds. Diego, who are we looking at here? Well, we have three great representatives of the birds of Colombia. The first one is the, uh, is the sparkling violeter. It's, uh, it's the second largest uh, hummingbird here in the, in the Andes of Colombia. It's a species for the mountains. And I have the fortune to have it here in my place. Uh, the second is a really wonderful mountain tanager, is the blue winged mountain tanager. It's a really, um, it's a common species for the Andean forest of Colombia in the three branches of Colombia. And the third is the majestic Andean condor that we have the fortune to have here in, in, in two ranges in the Andes, in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which is uh, uh, the, the, um, the tallest coastal mountain in the world. And we have a uh, small population of Andean condors there as well. 
just stunning. Um, and I just, those ears, that, the ears, they're just feathers, of course, but that pop out from the violet ear are just beyond. Um, wonderful. Thank you for that, Diego. Jeff, can you talk about the black pole warbler? Sure. The black pole warbler um, is one, uh, you just saw quickly over the screen, the, a little bit of uh, the, the, the map of the boreal forest. I know some people had, on the chat had asked where the boreal forest is, and it stretches from Alaska across Canada all the way to Newfoundland. Uh, about 1.5 billion acres, so a really big biome in one of the most intact forest areas on earth. And so the birds from, from the boreal forest, it's a cold place, they spill out and cross the hemisphere um, in the fall. And now they're streaming across um, the U.S. And, and, you know, showing up in all our backyards um, in parks and things as they're moving, moving north. And the black pole warbler is a really good example of that. That's a bird that has almost its entire breeding population um, just in the boreal forest and some new uh, migration research has, has been done on it showing the incredible pathways that these birds take. Bird the size of your fist that will fly out over the ocean sometimes for two and three days nonstop to get to South America uh, where they winter and right now they're, they're streaming back and um, very soon, I haven't seen one yet uh, where I am, but they'll be starting to, to push through um, and getting back home to the boreal forest to nest. Yeah, that's Wonderful. really cool. I remember we've mentioned the black hole warbler in previous episodes, and it's truly a phenomenal bird with an epic migration. So when you hear about the richness and diversity of all these species in the two key areas of Columbia and the boreal forest, the need to conserve these habitats becomes more and more clear. So partners are an important and necessary part of this work. So Shauna, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative fosters Indigenous nationhood as a way to conserve and manage Indigenous lands. And we support Indigenous nations to fulfill our cultural responsibility to land. And, the, and we do this in a number of ways, including in cre creating Indigenous protected areas, which are places that are identified by Indigenous communities for conservation. And similar in some respects to national parks, um, but they and they are indigenous led. And we're supporting the creation of indigenous guardian programs as well. Uh, guardians are trained experts who manage the lands for their communities, and guardian programs provide jobs that are rooted in their cultures that allow young people to be on the land and caring for it. As you can see from my my T-shirt that says uh, the land needs guardians. <laughs> I love that shirt. Wonderful. Thank you. So we actually have a video, I believe, that shows just what you're talking about, highlighting the guardians. So we're going to play that now. Indigenous guardians do that work that keeps lands and waters healthy. A guardian is somebody who manages and protects the land. Guardians have been here forever. There have been people who have given the, the land and the sea a voice. When our traditional territories were taken away or when um, our culture was taken away, a lot of people lost themselves and lost who they were as Indigenous peoples. What I like about the, the Guardians program is that it's allowing us to now take our power back. What do Indigenous Guardians do? Everything. What I do day to day, I uh, focus on patrolling, uh, assisting with search and rescue, Park management, we created our guardian program to, to help with conservation efforts around um, regulation and enforcement. We go out monthly to do staff gauge data collection on the rivers and streams within the traditional territory. And then we'll be moving into the morel mushroom monitoring season. We also, for the last probably 16 years, have carried out species at risk programs in our community. We have looked at a variety of species. We do lake sturgeon, uh, wood turtles. Really terrific work. Um, Shauna, thanks so much for you, uh, your work. So Jeff, there are plenty of bird species that directly link the landscapes we're talking about in Canada and in Colombia. They actually move between these places every year. We talked about one a little bit ago, the black pole warbler seen plenty of black pole warblers in Colombia, and then they go all the way up to the boreal. But what are some of the other iconic species that link these landscapes? Well, there's, there's so many. Um, one of the favorites of many people is, is the Canada warbler. Um, and that, that's, um, you know, a, a bird that's coming up um, sort of towards the tail end of migration often, but they're moving through right now. 
um, you know, beautiful bird. And it's a bird that's um, considered um, to be at risk in, in Canada. Um, so, so a bird of a lot of concern. Um, and, but there's other birds like the black Bernian warbler, you know, the bright orange throated black Bernian warbler um, is another example. Swainsons and great cheek thrushes, um, olive sided flycatchers. Um, there's, there's just so many um, that, that winter in, in Northern South America, that's one of the sort of strongholds of so many of the boreal breeding birds. And I understand there's a little bit of debate over whether Canada warbler is a fully appropriate name for this species, right? Yes, we have had some interesting discussions. Our Colombian colleagues have noted that the Canada, what we call the Canada warbler spends maybe more of its time in Colombia. And so they thought that maybe we should change the name to Colombia warbler. And we've talked a little bit about a way maybe to combine the two, you know, a Can Canalombia warbler or, or, or something like that. Canadian. I love Canadian. it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll brainstorm that. <laughs> so here's a question for you, Diego. Um, could you talk a little bit about the importance of stewardship across a bird's full life cycle? Definitely. Uh, well, birds don't know boundaries, so they don't know that they are crossing, you know, from Canada to the United States, and then they are entering to Central America. So they just fly down and fly up during their life cycle. So we just need to be sure the area that they are using as a stopover or wintering sites in all the countries and area that they are using are protected or are well managed. So we need more protected areas in Latin America. It, I mean, it's not worth it to just invest in one place because they are just using several points uh, while they are just moving uh, through the migration, for instance. So you can see the maps that uh, we showed earlier on the Canada warbler or, or other migrants. So we just need to be sure that they find wealthy ecosystems and wealthy areas in, in the entire uh, life cycle area, you know? So this is the most important thing for us in order to protect not just the migratory birds because uh, one of the things that we are doing is just protect areas that uh, serve both for birds, for migratory and also for resident birds. So we need to be sure that all these areas, all these ecosystems and all these areas are protected or well managed or have better practices in order to maintain that diversity during the whole year of migration. Yeah, thank you for that, Diego. So Shauna, in addition to the Guardians program, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative also works with communities across Canada to support Indigenous protected areas. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, for sure. Uh, well, Indigenous protected areas are generally huge. Um, you know, the one thing that we're wealthy in here is, is a huge landscape. And um, it's on a scale that's much larger than, than is possible in most other parts of the world. And that's great for birds um, for, their, for their breeding uh, seasons. Um, we are currently supporting 23 Indigenous nations across Canada to create Indigenous protected areas. And I'd like to share three examples with you that have already been completed. Starting in the Northwest, uh, the um, yellowish blob uh, up in that uh, Northwest corner is the Deje. And it's about five times the size of Yosemite. And the elders there call it the bread basket because, the because of the wildlife that has sustained people there for millennia. And moving to the east, uh, we have Thai Denenene, uh, which is in the Northwest Territories with Adeje. And it, this one is about three times the size of Yellowstone. Um, and Thai Denenene translates into the land of the ancestors. And it includes part of the Great Slave Lake, which is the deepest freshwater lake in North America. And then moving to the southwest, or sorry, the southeast uh, in Manitoba and Ontario, uh, you can see it right next to that, uh, that other large lake, Lake Winnipeg, uh, is Pamachuanaki World Heritage Site. And that translates into the land that gives life. And by comparison, it's about half the size of West Virginia. So truly a huge uh, protected area. It is the largest mixed cultural and natural world heritage site in North America. There were four First Nations that led in its creation, and archaeological evidence shows 
that the ancestors have been in relationship with these lands for at least 7,000 years. So just imagine if all of the 23 uh, indigenous nations we're supporting can realize their dreams to protect their traditional lands with indigenous protected areas and guardians. That would be one huge safe bird nursery. Fantastic. Yeah, really inspiring. And like David mentioned, it's really amazing work you're doing. So thank you for that. Um, so we have a question from one of our viewers. Pat asks, what role does ecotourism play in conservation? And I think that's a good question for you, Diego. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, Audubon one is using the, the bird-based tourism as uh, one of the main conservation tools in, in Colombia. So we partner with the, with the government of Colombia in order to develop uh, burden trails across several of the key ecosystems for both migratory and uh, resident birds. The key thing here is that people need uh, incomes. Uh, we have, uh, you know, poor people in the rural areas of Colombia that don't have too much um, economic opportunities. And bird-based tourism uh, brings that to them. So these high biodiversity areas don't have too much economic opportunities. So bringing these kind of opportunities, uh, just like a bird-based tourism and nature-based tourism, it's a, it's a way to support these communities. And then these communities are going to support uh, conservation of this ecosystem that we talked about earlier. Yeah, and I think it just shows how important it is to integrate not just the need for habitat protection and preservation, but it also takes into account societal and economic concerns. So uh, Shauna, could we ask your thoughts on this topic as well? Sure. Our research shows that indigenous conservation strengthens indigenous communities and nations. And indigenous uh, protected areas not only support ecotourism, but they support cultural tourism as well. And our indigenous guardian programs help to create jobs um, for the indigenous people to manage and protect those areas, which is similar to Diego, this, these are very important opportunities um, for the indigenous people that live in these areas. So these are new economies that help to respect and uplift their cultures. And I've heard indigenous guardians share how being a guardian has transformed um, their lives. And I've also heard about children who say that they want to grow up to be guardians. Um, and these guardians will be the leaders of tomorrow who will be armed with the values and knowledge of their elders and uh, with the knowledge that comes from science. And this uh, work helps to keep indigenous nations growing stronger and become fully respected and equally treated partners in Canada's system of governance and its economic and social growth. That's awesome. And it just shows how big of an impact it is when young people are interested in becoming involved as well. That's right. Oh, yeah. And so another viewer has a question. Does Audubon's work in Colombia also involve indigenous communities? And this is another good one for you, I think, Diego. Uh, yes. Well, uh, we have, we are not uh, working directly with indigenous communities as a, as a, you know, as a project, but uh, many of the people who were uh, trained into the Burden Trails uh, project uh, came from indigenous communities. So we had several examples, for instance, from the Wayu indigenous uh, communities in northern part of Colombia that participated in the in the in the project, and now they are themselves uh, birding guides uh, in the northern Colombia birding trail, for instance. We have another examples, uh, not just for indigenous people, but also for local communities that are involved in these kind of projects. So so yeah, definitely we have and. Uh, we are starting to, to support other areas of indigenous are interested in developing tourism as part of the efforts for conservation and, and income generation. And that helps create those jobs as Shana was talking about too. It's great, Diego, thank you. Um, so Jeff, a question for you. One of our viewers named David, shout out to my fellow Davids, wants to know whether the, in addition to the songbirds we've been talking about, there are shorebirds that link Columbia and the boreal forest? Yeah, they sure are. Um, there's a lot of um, shorebirds that uh, winter down in South America in different parts. Um, you know, the, the lesser yellow legs and the greater yellow legs, for example, um, stop over in the uh, Llanos of uh, Colombia and Venezuela. 
and, uh, and then make their way to the boreal where they breed almost all of the world's lesser yellow legs and greater yellow legs are um, breed just in the boreal forest, the solitary sandpiper, least sandpiper. And then most of the shorebirds stop over in the boreal, even if they're going up to the Arctic to nest, they stop over there on the way. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of linkages with shorebirds it's, and also waterfowl. Um, you know, most of the waterfowl that we enjoy in the winter, especially along our coasts in the, in the U.S., um, breed in the boreal forest. Um, you know, there's all sorts of birds that are coming from, from there. It's not just warblers. All right, so we have one more question for all of you panelists with us um, in the segment, and that is, what do birds mean to you? So let's start with Diego, and then we'd love to hear from Shauna and Jeff as well. Well, uh, that is an easy question, actually. Uh, I think uh, for me, the birds are uh, my personal connection with nature. You know, uh, it's, it's that link to, to the mother nature. So this is the, the first thing. And the second, it reminds me the, the greatness and the magic of the casual encounter. You can go to birding and you cannot see the same bird or the same species, even though with a difference of minutes. So that casual, you know, that, that, that casual thing, it's one of the, of the rewardings of, of the bird. So that's it. Thank you. What about you, Shana? Uh, well, I, I'll pick up on a theme that I heard Jeff Goodby talking about. And I think that's that birds are our teachers. Um, we, we learn to, how to live in this world in a good way. Um, by watching the birds and learning from them, just like we do from all our relations. For example, in the Anishinaabe Seven Sacred Laws, the eagle spreads its wings and welcomes in love. And it teaches us always to act in love, love the creator, love the earth, love yourself, your family, fellow human beings, and all our relations. And that's what birds mean to me. Beautiful. Yeah, what about you, Jeff? Yeah, well, it's, it's sort of a similar theme, you know, I think birds, especially in these times of technology and, you know, spending a lot of time in, indoors and things like that, you know, birds are this touchstone to the, the flow, the current of life that still goes on, you know, even as I'm sitting here with, you know, on the web on this, with the funny, fancy camera in front of me and all this, you know, I can hear a, a morning dove singing and a song sparrow singing and a catbird singing outside my kitchen window. And it reminds me that life is still out there. Life is just going on, you know, whatever we're doing and that we as humans are part of that life, um, you know, and, and just to be, to feel connected to, to that pulsing of life of the planet. Um, I think that's, you know, birds do that for, for me and for a lot of us. Beautifully put. Well, we're so grateful for the work that all of you do in your respective places to steward your lands, your communities, and the birds that we all share. Uh, thank you, too, for joining us tonight. Gracias por todo. Um, we hope that you both have a great rest of your day. Um, and we'll drop a couple more links in the chat for people who want to learn more. Thank you. Gracias. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. So now we are going to move on to our next segment. Um, we'll be talking about amazing migration facts with the Galbatross crew. And when we talk about spring migrants, our minds often jump to, understandably, the bright breeding plumages that we usually associate with male birds. So what about the female birds that are passing through our yards and outside our windows? So because of that topic that we want to talk about, we have invited our next group to tonight's show to talk about a very special project that they've hatched for Memorial Day weekend. And it's gonna help all of us learn how to identify these female birds that we're about to go into. So welcome to the show, Dr. Brooke Bateman, Stephanie Bilkey, Martha Harbison, and Joanna Wu. Welcome everybody. And thank you. Hello, thank you. So let's start with the first obvious question. Why do female birds look less color colorful to us than their male counterparts? And Martha, really I think you can take this one. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question, Christine. Uh, first, I want to point out, of course, that not all female birds, like you don't see universally drab female birds. Um, a lot of birds, in with, in when compared to the males, a lot of species, you'll, they're, mono, they're called monomorphic, which means that the males and females to us look alike. Uh, but when we're considering the, di the sexually dimorphic species, 
the prevailing thoughts, and nobody's quite sure, there's still actually active research uh, going into this, but the prevailing thought uh, that female, why female birds are drab is twofold. Number one is to protect them against predators because for a lot of species, it's the females that sit on the nest. So it not only protects them, but it protects any offspring that they uh, might be feeding, harboring, keeping warm uh, during the um, you know, incubation and early chick uh, time. Uh, the second reason that they think is that females just, they don't have to. So they can take all of that energy uh, that the males use in order to make really colorful plumage and come up with really fancy dances. Uh, and they can invest that in chick rearing and eggs. And so that actually like confers a little bit of a um, evolutionary benefit to them. Uh, one, uh, there is, a, there is like a class of birds that actually the females are more colorful than the males. Um, birds like phalaropes, which are found in the, uh, the uh, Pacific and Central Flyway, uh, the females are actually much brighter than the males and they actually act differently as well. They practice uh, polyandry where one female will have multiple male mates and the males, which are drab, are then the ones that sit on the nests and, and rear the chicks. Uh, so that sort of also suggests that this camouflage drabness is actually very important uh, for any bird that actually has to take it basically does all the primary caregiving. That's so cool. I didn't know that before. So I want to know what are all of your favorite female bird plumages? Uh, let's start with you, Stephanie. So last week I got to see a female cerulean warbler during migration, which was pretty exciting. And um, they have a little more subtle plumage compared to the male, but it's this teal kind of greenish blue color as you can see here. And that really helps the female kind of turn herself into a leaf. And that helps because they nest really high up in the canopy. And a fun fact about cerulean warblers, the female, um, when she's sitting on the nest, in order to leave the nest, she'll actually drop off and fall in free fall for a little bit and then fly away. And then that disguises her as a leaf. And um, so it doesn't attract predators to where her nest is located. Wow, that's some high-tech camouflage right there. Uh, what about you, Joanna? Do you have a favorite female bird plumage? Yeah, the one that comes to mind is the Williamson sapsucker. It's a woodpecker that lives in the beautiful conifer forests of the West. This is a female that's pulled up here. And when I saw my first pair at a cavity nest, their plumages were so strikingly different that I thought I was seeing two birds of different species. Later, I looked it up in my field guide and realized they were indeed raising chicks together and not vying for a resource or anything. It's incredible to me that evolution would drive sexes in the same species to just look so different from one another. Yeah, really cool. So Brooke, I believe you have a favorite bird plumage oh, yeah. to share as well. Yeah, so, so I really love female red-winged blackbirds. Every year in migration, I get tricked by these because um, they just, they're just striking birds. They have like, crisp uh, streaks, striations, a white um, bar by their eye, but they can be really variable in their color. They can be more pink or more orange. Uh, and they're very different compared to the male. So the male is black with the, this really distinctive wing bar. But yeah, every year in migration, I see my first female red winged blackbird and I'm like, oh, what is that? Is that a sparrow? Like, that's a really cool new bird. And then I'm like, ah, oh, it's a female red winged blackbird. I do the same thing. I punked every single year. <laughs> You'd think after 15 years I'd learn, but I have not. Nope. <laughs> Well, and if our Facebook page is any indication, millions of people have that same experience every spring. <laughs> so um, great examples. Thank you all for those. And another thing that we want to talk about is songs and vocalizations. For centuries, people thought that only male birds would sing, uh, which we now know is not true. Many female birds use song in all kinds of interesting and beautiful ways. Um, so what are some examples of female bird songs that you really enjoy? Joanna, let's start with you. Yeah, I'm going to use another West Coast example because I bird mostly in California. Um, the wren chit is a coastal scrub bird in the West Coast, and it is said to be the most sedentary bird in North America. It rarely moves more than a thousand feet from where it was born, which is just a very short distance. <laughs> Pairs defend year-round territories and communicate with each other throughout the day. The female sings a song 
like a ping pong ball dropping on the table. Can we hear that now? Yeah, great, thanks. And then um, the male sings a very similar song, except let's listen for his song to speed up to a end. Yeah, they're very similar, but slightly different. So I thought it was really neat that you, oh, also since they're in such a you can almost never see their branch hit, but you can tell just the sex of the bird just by listening. Yeah, that's really cool. Birding by ear is a whole other skill that I am inspired to, to improve on. <laughs> so here's a question for you, Brooke. Could you please share some examples of how conservation plans have been improved once female observations have been taken into consideration? Yeah, that's a really important thing to, to consider. So we were just talking about in the last segment about full life cycle conservation. Well, about a decade ago, there was a researcher named Dr. Ruth Bennett, and she was able to determine that golden wing warblers the females actually flock to lower elevations in Honduras where they go to winter um, compared to the males who are at like a bit of a higher elevation. And so the plans, the conservation plans, just took into account the higher elevation habitats that the males were using. And because of this, the females actually lost two times as much of their habitat um, in the, the 2000s time period. And, and this is for a species that's lost about 70% of their population. They're, they've declined. And so th this is a really big deal to, to have the, the females losing that amount of habitat. And they also found that two thirds of vulnerable North American migratory bird species, they overwinter in different habitats based on male or female. But only one out of 10 plans actually accounted for that. So if we start adding female uh, birds and the observations of female birds along with which habitats they use in the winter, it's really going to help improve the conservation plans for migratory birds in North America. Yeah, and I think that's a really good transition into your I Saw Female Bird project where you are actually asking people to count the female birds that they're seeing from their own yards or their own windows. So Martha, could you tell us a little more about this project? Sure. Um, we're actually asking people to do two different things based on their comfort. The first, of course, is to just go out over Memorial Day weekend and look for female birds. You know, if you see a male, spend a little bit more time, look around to see if you can see uh, the mate as well. They have, because they're more drab, you may have to actually look a little bit more closely uh, for them. And many of them may be on the nests now. Um, once you do that, uh, hit us up on social media, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, and use the hashtag I saw a bird, and you can tell us about it or take photos and tweet those. We totally want to hear about all the female birds that you're seeing over the weekend. We will be going out as well and looking for female birds in our local areas uh, too. The second thing is a little bit more involved, um, but for anybody that's used to field guide, you know that most field guides are very compact and they have a limited amount of information about each species. The idea, of course, is to understand what species you're looking at. And so a lot of the female specific um, knowledge is not actually included in your standard field guide. And most of it is actually squirreled away in monographs and in specialty, uh, specialty books. Um, and so we're hoping that we can crowdsource uh, some of the female identification tricks that other people have come up with um, in order to actually be able, when you're looking at these monomorphic species where the, where the birds look exactly alike, males and females, you're like, okay, well, is there a behavioral difference? Do only the females like sit on the nest? Do they have specialized vocalizations like we just heard with the wren tit? Um, there's one in particular uh, that we used, the galbatrosses used last year during the World Series of Birding to get our uh, American oyster catcher uh, down in Cape May. As it turns out, um, the oyster catchers have black eye flex in their eyes, and that's a sex-linked trait, and only females have black flex. Um, I think you guys have a photo of that you might want to show. Um, but anyway, we actually went out and we found ourselves an oyster catcher, and we looked, this is a, actually a black oyster catcher, which is found on the West Coast, um, whereas the World Series of Birding happens, happens in New Jersey. But yeah, we like looked, we got the spotting scope on that bird's eye, it had flex in it, and we all gave ourselves, the galpatrosses gave ourselves a high five, because we're like, yes, we, it works. Um, so yeah, we're hoping we have a website. And 
but we're hoping that you'll like fill out a Google form with your own, uh, you know, uh, tips and tricks on how to find and identify female birds in the, uh, in the field. Anybody that has that arcane wizard level knowledge, we want to hear about it. Yeah, I love that eye flag. It's so cool. And ditto to the crowdsourcing and sharing your observations with the hashtag I saw bird. So keep those coming. And speaking of, what are some ways that viewers can identify female birds? Stephanie, I think this is a good one for you. Yeah, well, as Martha was saying, um, you can use a field guide and look up um, the differences between the sexes if it's in the field guide. And there are a lot of sexually dimorphic species, even that visit bird feeders and backyards like northern cardinals and American goldfinches that many people are familiar with. But then um, for our Galvatross project, we've been do digging into extra research to really learn about what else to look for, like the eye fleck that Martha pointed out for the oyster catchers and also behaviors. So if you see birds um, um, acting like a pair and nesting in your yard or at your local park, you can do some extra research to find out is one, uh, one sex the, the primary uh, incubator of the nest, such as American robins, and that can help you learn um, which is the female. Yeah, there's like good things to pay attention to. So Martha, you mentioned earlier this cool story um, and you said that this whole project came together because you were all actually on a team at the World Series of Birding last year. Could you tell us a little bit more about that story? Yeah, so um, our former colleague, uh, Prabhita Saha, who has been on this show before but couldn't make it tonight, uh, contacted me and Stephanie and Brooke and was like, I want to compete in the World Series of Birding with a bunch of Audubon people, and uh, I want to look only I want to look for just the female birds. And we're just like, okay, I'm in. This is amazing. Uh, so we like put together some spreadsheets, and we started coming up with some of these behavioral, you know, things looking at like density. Um, and we got down there, um, and we're just like, well, what is what are we gonna do? It's like, what is this gonna be like? Um, and the word got out, so we went out. But word got out that we had this goal that we're only going to count the female birds because you know what the World Series of Birding is a birdathon. The goal is to get as many to take as many species as possible, and the winners typically get more than 200 um, in the course of 24 hours. And so here we are, like uh, technically hamstringing ourselves because not only are female birds hard to find, uh, the World Series happens in early May, and many female birds don't migrate until after the males do because the males come up in established territory, and then the females. Uh, come in later. Uh, but people like found out about this and they got really choked up and amazed They're like this is the most awesome concept I've ever heard of in my life. Um, and with the World Series, there's a WhatsApp group that all the participants join and people will like t basically like tag people and be like, hey, we saw this species headed like a Mississippi kite. It's like it's headed this direction. Anybody in this area look up, you should be able to see it. But we had people tagging us specifically and saying, we found female bobolinks over in this field, you should drive over there and see them. Somebody else like, we saw a female surf scoter go to the sea watch. So like our other like technical competitors were just like, no, 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 we wanna help you guys. This is an amazing uh, concept. Uh, we came in second to last uh, with 31 species. Uh, we beat a team of toddlers called the Tiny Tots. Um, and I'm sorry, Tiny Tots um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for that. Um, so we were hoping to do it again this year, but of course we can't. Um, but maybe uh, next year we'll try it again and maybe we'll get 32 species next year. Yeah, I love the teamwork involved. And maybe you'll come, you know, it's competition with the tiny tot. So we'll see who, who, who try recruiting them. I think you're like, come, come. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you so much everybody for joining us today. And for the viewers at home who would like to participate, participate, you can visit femalebirdday.wordpress.com to submit your favorite tips for IDing female birds, and we'll drop that in the links below as well. And then if you'd like to share what your favorite female bird observations are, just keep using the hashtag I saw bird um, on social media platforms this weekend. Yes, thank you all very much. Really fun. And I saw one of our viewers suggest that this would be a fun Mother's Day campaign, so maybe next year. Well, have fun, everybody. So uh, we want to close the show today with something that's good for birds and good for you. For those who may not be aware, Audubon has a free app 
that uh, gives you all kinds of information about birds. So what we wanna do this evening in the next couple of minutes is walk through the app and also ask you, if you don't have it already, to download it yourself and then share it with three friends. Um, so we are pulling it up here. This is what the app looks like when you uh, open it up on your phone. So uh, let's go through an example of how we might use this when we're out in the field or looking from the kitchen window uh, and seeing a bird we don't recognize. So let's imagine that we're somewhere in Texas um, and we've just right seen a bird. Yeah, Christine's in Texas. So this is in honor of you, Christine. Uh, we've just seen a bird out the window in kind of a dry, scrubby area, and it's small. It's about the size of a sparrow. So the app will let you select the bird size. You can tap sparrow there. Um, and then we can see at the top that we have some other features we can choose. So let's choose its color. Um, and the bird that we just saw is mostly green. It's kind of a beautiful grass, green color all over. Um, and then let's go up and choose the type of bird. Um, this will let us say, was this a water bird? Was this a raptor? But no, uh, it was, um, it was, let's see, let's scroll back up. Uh, it was a perching bird. It was a songbird that was sort of hopping around on the ground, small feet, certainly not built to kill anything. Uh, so then on the next tab, we can um, choose the activity. Um, and the bird that we saw, let's say, was um, hopping on the ground. See sort of a sparrow-like silhouette there. So we're seeing that as we're tapping these different choices, the app is narrowing down the kinds of birds that we might have seen. So we're down to about nine matches, um, and none of them look exactly like what we had in mind. So we might have to do a little further sleuthing. And maybe this is actually one of these examples where we saw a female bird that looks different from the male in the picture. So let's go ahead and tap that first result there, the painted bunting, and see what else we can discover. So there we go. This is the adult female painted bunting. She's a beautiful bright green color all over, which gives her great camouflage while she's nesting and raising her babies. Um, and so that's a really good example of how this app can help you narrow down the observations that you find. Um, once you're there, you can read about the bird, you can play the different songs and calls, which may help you match um, something you've been hearing. Um, and then we've also got maps that show you where the bird is during summer, winter, and migration. Um, so there's a lot more features on the app. In the interest of time, we won't walk through them all now, but we'll pull up a screen that shows you where you can get the app for yourself. Um, we also want to encourage you to share it with people in your life who love birds or could love birds. Um, so you can download the Audubon app. Again, it's totally free on the iPhone app store or uh, from Google Play. Um, you can go to audubon.org slash app to learn more, see some more of the features. So again, we encourage you to download that, give it a try. And whether you already have it or whether you're downloading it for the first time tonight, please share it with three friends because as we heard from Jeff Goodby, birds can connect us to important people in our lives and deepen our own relationships with each, with each other as people as well. Um, so that's our show for tonight. Thank you so much to all of our guests. Thank you to all of you, our viewers. We hope that you have a safe week and that you enjoy spring migration as it continues. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody.